In the spirit of Jesus Christ, welcome on this glorious morning. It is a blue sky day. My crocuses have grown another two inches this past week, and I have put my snow shovel away. Join us in the opening words of Scripture, new words for a new month. Jesus said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you. Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. Good morning, and welcome to Unity Presbyterian Church for our worship service this morning. Parents, be sure to note that there is an inclusive Easter egg hunt coming up Saturday, March 20th here at Unity. In youth group, you have a fireside gathering today at 5 p.m., food and fun provided. Bring a camp chair if you have one. And we'll be celebrating communion this morning, so be sure to have your elements at hand and ready to join us. Now let us worship together. This morning we continue our journey to Jerusalem. We have been to Caesarea Philippi. We have been to Mount Hermon, the Mount of Transfiguration. We have been back down the mountain where Jesus encountered the Father with the sick boy. And today we journey southward with Jesus where east of the Jordan River, he encounters the rich young ruler who asked, Master, how do I inherit eternal life? Join us again on the journey to Jerusalem. During Lent, we reflect on the meaning of suffering. Through suffering, we become aware of God's presence. All around us, we see sorrow, brokenness, and pain. Through suffering, we become aware of God's power. We struggle with our own trials and search in vain for answers. Through suffering, we learn to trust God's promises. We think of the magnitude of Christ's suffering on the cross. We cry out helplessly when our burdens seem unbearable. Through suffering, we learn to comfort others.
Into the warming sunlight of God's love strides human sin and our willful disobedience. Join us as we speak together the truth about ourselves and ask for God's forgiveness. Join us in prayer. Great God, you are the giver of all good gifts. You generously provide for all our needs. You offer us the riches of Christ. Why do we still feel impoverished? We confuse our needs with our wants. The world says we need more things, more power, more fame, bigger houses, thinner bodies, fewer wrinkles. The world says we do not have enough, that we are not enough, that we are incomplete. Jesus tells us to consider the lilies of the field and the birds of the air. Forgive us for our excessive striving for affluence and our spiritual bankruptcy. Forgive us for seeking the filling, the emptiness inside with worldly things which shall pass away. Help us set aside every sin that entangles us. Help us throw off everything that hinders us from a joyous relationship with you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. That the Lord should be merciful and gracious to us is more than we can understand. In the upper room at the table, Jesus promised his disciples on the eve of his departure, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, neither let your hearts be troubled nor afraid. And so with God's mercies, the peace of Christ descends upon us and we are invited to share it with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
Our gospel reading this morning comes from the 10th chapter of the gospel according to Mark, beginning at the 17th verse. Here we encounter a young man who had everything except that which he longed for most. Listen for the word of God. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. The young man said to Jesus, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words, but Jesus said to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who could be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. This is the word of the Lord. Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. This morning we continue our journey to Jerusalem and the snow-covered slopes of Mount Hermon are far behind. The village of Caesarea is several weeks past. The Sea of Galilee is receding in the distance, and now Jesus has crossed the River Jordan to the east. We know from the Gospel writers that along the way in Jesus' final fateful journey to Jerusalem, he encountered multitudes of people seeking healing. Some of them were like the father who brought his young son to Jesus when Jesus and Peter and James and John came from the Mount of Transfiguration and the father pleaded with Jesus to heal his boy of his seizures. But we also know that while many came to Jesus seeking physical healing, there were others who were not physically sick. For them, it was a soul sickness from which they suffered. In our gospel reading this morning, we learn that as Jesus was making his way southward, crossing the very river where he had previously been baptized by John the baptizer, that a young man came up to him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, it's only later in Mark's telling of the tale that we learned that the young man had great wealth. Matthew echoes that same narrative about the young man. Luke is very explicit, and he tells that the young man is the rich young ruler. Good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? 
And immediately Jesus deflects the man's acclaim. Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And once again, we find Jesus pointing beyond himself to his heavenly father. This calls to mind that great hymn found in the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Christians at Philippi, where Paul cites this early Christian hymn, which says that Christ did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant and becoming obedient unto death, even death on a cross, that at his name every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So Jesus has dismissed the man's acclamation, good teacher, and gets right to the point, answering the man's question. He said, you know the commandments, and then he repeats the fourth through the ninth commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. You shall honor your father and mother. Have you ever noticed that the f earlier commandments have to do with our relationship with God but because God has created us to dwell in community and treat one another with justice and compassion, the remaining commandments tell us how we are to live with one another, how we are to treat one another. So being very deeply acquainted as a good Jew with the Mosaic Covenant and the Mosaic Law, the Ten Commandments, Jesus has reminded the man of his obligation to keep God's commandments, not because these are hoops to jump through, but because these are principles for a healthy living. God is not a capricious God who, like the Greek or Norse gods, ask us to do strange things just for their pleasure. God has given us these commandments that we might live. You know the commandments, Jesus reminds the young man. And then he tells them what they are. And the young man, you can imagine with great frustration in his voice, says, teacher, teacher, I have kept these from my youth. Well, if he had kept them from his youth, why does he still have such a longing Now, let's back up for just a moment. What was the young man's question of Jesus? Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Here's a man who had accumulated great wealth through all the enterprises he had founded. Here's a young man who had become a ruler among the people. This is obviously a person of achievement. This is a person who is obviously a doer. So it would only be natural for him to think that the, the secret to eternal life lies in his doing something just like you need to do something to become successful in business and accumulate wealth, just like you need to do something in order to be acclaimed a ruler or a leader among the people, what must I do? As though it were all up to this young man, and he claims that he has done all these things. Teacher, I have kept all these from his youth. Wait a minute. You mean you never told a fib when you were a kid? You mean you never put on airs and wore a pretense, pretending you were somebody you were not, just so that people would think well of you? You mean you never fudged on a figure on your income tax return or padded your resume to make yourself look better than you really are? 
You kept all the commandments, did you? So the young man says, but he is still empty. He is still a searcher and seeker. When Jesus learned the man's self-appraisal that he had kept all the commandments, Jesus looked at him, loved him. Can you see the compassion in Jesus' eyes? He aches for this young man. He knows how the man is tormented. And he says to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Now, there are two dangers listening to this story. The first is to hear Jesus' words, which we listened to earlier, about how it is more difficult for a person of wealth to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a camel, and to assume if you hold wealth that you cannot attain the kingdom of God. That's not what Jesus is saying. And the second is, when we are tempted to exclude ourselves from the story, saying to ourselves, well, I'm not wealthy. I'm, I'm very middle class. Compared to most of the world, all of us are wealthy when it comes to worldly things. So don't think this passage and Jesus' response to the rich young ruler does not have a bearing in your life. Now, the other thing to note is that Jesus had sized up this rich young ruler and then told him to sell all that he owned and to give to the poor. But that wasn't Jesus' prescription for everyone. Take, for example, when Nicodemus the Pharisee came to Jesus in the dark of night, most likely so he would not be seen by other Pharisees and wonder what he was doing with this upstart peasant from Galilee. And Nicodemus, too, was a searcher and seeker, and he had questions of Jesus, recognizing, as had the young man, that Jesus was a teacher who was able to unfold for others the presence of God and what God's kingdom looks like in ways which the common person could grasp. And Jesus sized up Nicodemus' problem. And remember, in that day, members of the religious class, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, would have been a wealthy people. We read in other places in the Gospels how they were dressed in fine clothing. So Nicodemus was most likely wealthy, but Jesus did not say to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, I know your problem. You have to get rid of all your stuff, give it to the poor, drop it off at goodwill, and then you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus recognized Nicodemus' problem was that he was living a worn out spirituality, a spirituality which had begun to lose its life. As a Pharisee, the Pharisees were a people who were set apart and devoted to the keeping of the law. And it had become such a drudgery, such a daily grind, that for Nicodemus, apparently he had forgotten that obeying the law was intended for a simple purpose of uniting him with God and with his fellow humanity. So what was the prescription Jesus gave to Nicodemus? He said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again or born anew. Or take Joseph of Arimathea, in whose tomb Jesus' lifeless body was laid after the crucifixion. 
to own one's own tomb meant one was wealthy. So you can see Jesus does not give the same prescription to everyone. He, it's as though he peers into our heart and he understands what our particular soul sickness is and he offers the remedy. We may not be wealthy, but I challenge you this afternoon, take a look in your attic, take a look in your basement, take a look in your garage and ask yourself, do I have too much stuff? Do you know how many billions of dollars these storage industry is worth, and you see these storage units all around the area, and they are all filled to the brim with stuff, stuff, more stuff. And most likely, somewhere in your home, you have stuff that hasn't come out of the box in years. But stuff, physical stuff, isn't the only stuff which hinders us from the kingdom of God? Is your schedule so full, so cluttered that you can barely keep up, that you don't have time for yourself or for your family? Are you beset with unresolved emotional conflicts which drag you down and hold you back? Are you nursing an anger or resentment which you will just not let go? Have you lost someone you loved, and rather than walking through the valley of the shadow of death to its end with God by your side, have you instead created a shrine of sorrow and a mausoleum of meaning living in your sorrow? Jesus knew that the rich man, young man had all this wealth, all these possessions, and it was hindering him spiritually. That was his soul sickness. I prefer one of the older translations, which remarks regarding the young man's reaction to Jesus' teaching. The scripture simply reads, and the young man went away sorrowful. He was sad because he had all this stuff. And apparently he did not want to let go of it. What's the stuff in your life? What's the baggage you carry? What's the freight that's not adding and enriching your life and giving it meaning? After the young man left, because he had great possessions and an apparent unwillingness to, un to let go of them, Jesus turned to his disciples in a teaching moment, and he said how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And by now, the disciples' eyes must have widened the size of a silver dollar. They were perplexed by his words. And Jesus repeated to them, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't say it's impossible, but he does say it can be pretty difficult. The disciples were astounded at what Jesus had said. Talking among themselves, they remarked, then who can be saved? We generally think that God has favored those who are wealthy, and if they're going to have trouble getting into the kingdom of heaven, what about the common person like you or me? And Jesus looks at them, and he says, for mortals, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, we might be like the the young man with the many possessions. And we might say, well, I've, I've kept the commandments, uh, or at least most of them, uh, uh, at least most of the time. I've tried to live like Jesus. 
many of us could say that. But the truth is, you and I cannot keep all the commandments. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, said, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you and I can never be as perfect as Jesus. To live up to all the commandments, to live as Jesus lived and love as Jesus loved, would require us to, to climb an ethical Mount Everest whose summit you and I can never attain. But we keep focusing on the question, Master, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You don't have to do anything except follow Jesus. Decades ago, there was a popular book, a bestseller, entitled, I'm Okay, You're Okay. Everybody was reading it. But it's lousy theology. It's certainly not Calvinist theology. It certainly does not echo Paul's words when he wrote, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I propose to you the Christian version of I'm okay, you're okay, would read, I'm not okay, and you're not okay. But God says, that's okay, because God offers us forgiveness when we repent. It's not about what we do. Don't tell me that the heart of the Christian faith is just being a good person. You can't be good enough. But God can be gracious enough. So join us on the journey to Jerusalem. And we will move beyond the foot of the cross where Jesus died for us and make our way to the empty tomb as we follow us, as we follow Jesus into eternity and the kingdom of heaven. Friends, we're about to celebrate the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are tired of sitting and want to be forgiven, if you are carrying heavy burdens and want to find rest, if you want to be reconciled with all of God's children, if you want to live in a hopeful anticipation of God's coming kingdom, join us at this table. Christ has set a place for you. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Join us in the great thanksgiving. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God, our Creator and Redeemer. In your wisdom you made all things and sustained them by your power. You formed us in your image to love and serve you, but we forgot your promises and abandoned your commandments. In your mercy, you did not reject us, 
but still claimed us as your own. When we were slaves in Egypt, you freed us and led us through the waters of the sea. You fed us with heavenly food in the wilderness and satisfied our thirst from desert springs. On the holy mountain, you gave us your law to guide us in your way. Through the waters of the Jordan, you led us into the land of your promise, and you sustained us in times of trial. You spoke through prophets, calling us to turn from our willful ways to new obedience and righteousness. You sent your only Son to be the way to eternal life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels and with the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He took upon himself the weight of our sin and carried the burden of our guilt. He shared our life in every way, and though tempted, was sinless to the end. Baptized as your own, he went willingly to his death, and by your power was raised to new life. In his dying and rising, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant of water and the Spirit. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ, except this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And now, O oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and the cup that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Help us, O oh God, to be obedient to your call to love all your children, to do justice, and show mercy, and to live in peace with your whole creation. Guide us through the desert of life. Quench our thirst with the living waters. Satisfy our hunger with the bread of heaven. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection when with all the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, all or honor and glory are yours, almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Hear us as we pray together the prayer which Jesus taught us to say, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take. Eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said, I am the bread of life.
In the same manner, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink you all of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Jesus said, I am the living water. She and he that believe in me shall neither hunger nor thirst, but have the gift of eternal life. Join us in the prayer after communion printed in your bulletin. O God of all mercy and compassion, our souls are restless until they rest in you. Thank you for bringing us together at your table where we have feasted from the abundance of your love. Imprison us within the bounds of your love that we may be free to joyfully serve, fed and refreshed by your eternal care send us from this place to bring others to your table, that they too may enjoy Christ's love. Amen. Go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all persons. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of his spirit. It's not what you do to inherit eternal life. It is what God has done in Christ. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, be with us and God's children everywhere now and in the life to come. On to Jerusalem. <laughs>